Good afternoon to all of the participants who joined the Bootcamp Today Business Model Canvas presented by Jose Glutier. First, let me introduce him. He has a Bachelor of Science and Economics degree from the University of Buenos Aires, where he also worked as Assistant Professor for Advanced Statistics for two years. His previous experience includes working as consultant for the Embassy of the El Salvador in Argentina, investment banking, and pension fund management. Currently, he plays as program officer for the John America Business Trust in Washington, D.C. Um, you can participate picking up the little yellow hand in the window for Ask the Word. Also, you can send us your questions by reading or using the chat to read them at the end of this session. Um, remember that this session for part of the previous coaching of TIC Americas 2017. Well, welcome, Mr. Culture. It's a pleasure to be with you today, and the word is yours. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you uh, today on uh, Thanksgiving. Uh, if you are uh, not a U.S. resident, uh, you might be at the office or uh, or doing your daily activities, but here today in the U.S. Uh, we're celebrating Thanksgiving. Uh, so happy holidays to everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and begin the presentation and then hopefully get some turkey afterwards. Uh, so today we're going to talk about, uh, about the creating a business model canvas. This is a, a really uh, exciting tool that most of you uh, that are starting a business or have a business idea will find very uh, useful and helpful throughout the process. Uh, let me start off by saying that a business model canvas is not a business plan. These are completely different things uh, and you should not replace your business plan with a business model canvas. The business model canvas will help you um, show your business plan in a more simplified and visual way. That is the difference between the two. This is a, a, a summary of your business plan and it helps uh, for understanding uh, of the business model. So very different things. Uh, let's keep that in mind. A business model and a business model canvas, it's uh, very different from the business plan and it should not replace uh, the business plan, which is a more extensive document that shows uh, with more detail how the business model works. The business model canvas will be used to exemplify how the business model works and how it makes sense. So by making that quick uh, differentiation, uh, let me just start off by welcoming, welcoming you all. I'm very excited to be talking a little bit about uh, this tool, very helpful tool. Uh, this is part of the boot camp uh, platform, virtual platform. These are the webinars that we use to provide training to young entrepreneurs that are participating in the talent and innovation competition of the Americas, whether you're participating in the startup challenge, in the eco challenge, or the Caribbean innovation competition. So let's go ahead and start. Um, we should begin on what it is, or why use it, rather than what it is. Uh, the way that we define a business model canvas uh, or the way that we describe this purpose is that it serves as a starting point and promotes a shared understanding of what the business idea is. This is a, a very easy way to exemplify what your business idea is and show it to everyone. Uh, it allows you to describe and think through the process of the business model of your organization and not only of your organization but also uh, you can make, uh, you can uh, build a business model canvas uh, from the business model of your competitors or any other enterprise. This is a very good exercise when you're analyzing not only your organization but your competition as well. And as I said before, it's a, it's a very simplified version of your business plan that covers the, the four main areas that your business plan should hold, which uh, are the customers, the type of customers you are uh, catering to, uh, the, the, the offer, what are you offering, your value proposition, the infrastructure of your business and also the financial uh, feasibility or viability of, of your business idea. So the starting point of any good discussion, meeting or, or workshop on a business model uh, innovation should be a shared understanding of what a business model actually is. 
So the, we need a business model concept that everybody understands. And the business model canvas, it's a great tool to accomplish that. Uh, we need the, the BMC, or business model canvas. Uh, we need it to facilitate the description and discussion of a business idea or business model. So we need to start from the same point and talk about the same thing. That's really important when you when you're evaluating if you want to carry out a new product or start a company. And the challenge is uh, that the concept must be simple, uh, it must be relevant, and intuitively understandable, while not oversimplifying the complexities of how enterprises function. That is really important. It, it is a it's, it is a simple way to show uh, your business model, but you also don't want to oversimplify the complexities of it. Uh, also, the business model canvas uh, is a concept that allows you to describe and think through the business model of your organization. Uh, the concept has been applied and tested around the world and is already uh, being used by organizations such as IBM, Ericsson, Deloitte, uh, and many more. So it's a proven concept. Um, the concept can become a shared language that allows you to easily describe and manipulate business models to create a new strategy alternatives. Um, without such shared language, it is difficult to systematically challenge assumptions about one's business model and innovate successfully. So it, it, it's not only a tool you use when you're trying to start a business, but also when you want to launch a new product or launch a new service. Uh, it could be used at very different stages of, uh, of your company. So the business model can best be described through nine basic building blocks, and we're going to talk about that in a little bit. So just as an introduction, uh, we're going to be we're going to be segmentating the business model canvas through nine basic building blocks to show the logic of how a company intends to make money. Uh, the nine blocks cover the four main areas of business that I previously said: the, the customers, the the offer or, or the value proposition we're doing, the infrastructure, and the financial viability. Uh, the business model is like a blueprint for a strategy to be implemented uh, through organizational structures, processes, and, and systems. So let's go ahead um, and go on to the next slide. So as I was talking to you a little bit before, um, what is it? It's uh, basically a business model on one page. Uh, it's a global standard. It's been used by millions of companies all of, of all sizes. This is not only used by companies like IBM, but also uh, for a startup, for young entrepreneurs that are starting out with, the, with their business ideas. Um, you can use the canvas to describe, design, challenge, and pivot your business model. And it works in conjunction with the value proposition canvas and other strategic management and execution tools and processes that don't, we're not going to talk about those in this specific webinar but we're, I will be more than glad to talk about that afterwards. So talking a little bit about the, the composition of the BMC, the Business Model Canvas, uh, as I said before, it's made up of nine blocks. Uh, and we're going to talk a little bit about them uh, one by one into detail, and we're gonna, I'm going to show you the, the main questions you need to ask yourself in order to determine what information goes in each block. Uh, but just a quick overview, we're talking about the customer segments, the value propositions, the channels. Uh, this, this refers to the channels where you're going to connect uh, your value proposition to the customer segments, uh, the customers, uh, the customer relationships, the revenue streams, the key resources, key activities, key partnerships you need to have because you're not going to do everything by yourself. You, you need to um, hire people outside of your company to do certain jobs. Uh, and finally, the co cost structure, which is something that you usually leave for last once you have the infrastructure uh, of the rest of the blocks. So going a, a little bit more deeper into each segment, uh, here's a, a, little, a little picture I want to show you guys. It's uh, customer segments. It says that an organization serves one or several customer segments, you may want to to only cater to one specific type of um, of customer, or you may want to serve various customers, and you're going to have different customers on this um, on this business model canvas. It's it's all going to be way more clear when I present to you 
uh, the business model canvas, uh, how it looks like, and, and when we do an example of it, which we're going to do. By the way, before I continue, uh, we're going to have a, a Q&A session towards the end. So if you have any questions that are arising, you can either uh, type them down right now, and I'll answer them towards the end. There's a questions tab that you can type down your question. Or if you want to uh, talk, if you want to make your intervention, you can also push the raised hand button. It's a, a hand uh, button. It's really simple. Just push it. Uh, when we're in the Q&A part of this webinar, and we'll unmute your microphone so that you can make your uh, your intervention through your microphone. Just make sure that you have a working microphone. But if not, if it's more easier for you, uh, you can just type down the question, and I'll be more than glad to answer. So going along, uh, we went to the second block of the business model canvas, uh, the value proposition that seeks to solve customer problems and satisfy customers' needs with value propositions. Uh, this may be a bundle of services, a bundle of products, or a bundle of services and products. Uh, we're going to see that in a little bit. The channels, as I said before, uh, value propositions are delivered to the customers through communication, distribution, and sales channels. There are, there are different ways depending on your service or product, and it's basically the way that you uh, provide those things, your value proposition, to the customer. Uh, customer relationships talks a little bit about um, how customer relationships are established and maintained with each customer segment. This is basically how you uh, incentivize your customers to be faithful to your brand and stay with you and not change to a different one. Uh, the fifth building block is the revenue streams. Uh, these are results from the value propositions success successfully offered to customers. Uh, the key resources, it's uh, talking about the, the assets required to offer and deliver the previously described elements. Uh, key resources is what you need to actually create your value proposition. And the key activities are what you need to do in order to, to create that uh, value proposition, in order to create your product or create your service. Um, key partnership talks a little bit about the activities that are outsourced, as I said before. Uh, and some resources that are acquired outside of the enterprise. Let's remember that entrepreneurship is not an individual task. It's something that you need to be uh, connected and in partnership with other people around you. So this is basically where you summarize the, the key partnerships you need to have in order to make uh, your idea viable. And last but not least, the cost structure. Uh, it's the business model elements that result in the cost structure. Uh, we're talking about everything you need to do uh, to pay in order to to create a bit, uh, to create a product or a service. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about it in more detail, but I want to show you what it looks like. This is really important. Um, this is just one page. What we're looking at right now are the main, the nine main building blocks of a BMC, of a business model canvas. As you may see, uh, we have different blocks with different headers. Uh, we have the customer segments, the revenue streams, the customer relationships, everything I was talking a little bit about before on a pre-formatted square box. And this is only one page, um, so now you can imagine why it doesn't really substitute your business plan. It really is a very simple and effective tool to show how your business model works. And it's basically the first thing that you need to show and that you need to make sense out of when you're trying out a new service, a new product, or a new business idea. So it's a really simple way to spark innovation with your teammates, to you yourself um, make your thoughts or, or determine if your idea is going to be viable. And once you have a good business model canvas, uh, you can present this as an introduction to a potential investor, to a potential business partner, or to a potential employee that you need to, to kind of uh, convince to go and work with you, for example. So once again, uh, as, as the same as the elevator pitch, when you do a pitch, the objective is to get a second meeting, or in this case, you show the business model canvas to get, uh, let's say, a potential investor interested in actually going through your business plan. Because here you're going to show that it's a viable idea, that it makes uh, financial sense, 
uh, and then you do have the necessary skills and, and, and key activities and resources to actually make it happen. But on the business plan, on that more detailed document, you do need to explain how you're going to make it happen. So these are uh, segments that we're going to fill out with keywords. It's not that you're going to, to write huge uh, long paragraphs, but keywords that help you explain each block and how it works. Um, so just a quick note before we go, the, the, uh, before we go on to the next section, uh, it's really important that you know that, that this is a great tool to work uh, with your team. So in that sense, if you're doing it on yourself, you might want to do it on a computer or just print out this template and start doing it by hand. But what I would recommend if you're working with a team is to do it on a big uh, cardboard, uh, on, a, on a big table. Uh, you set out this uh, maybe one meter by one meter uh, cardboard and do the segments with uh, markers or, or whatever you have on hand. And then just start, you know, brainstorming with post-its. The post-its notes, uh, there's little square notes that you can uh, push and they stick to the paper. And you can start doing this kind of brainstorming on the type of customer segments you want to tackle or the different value propositions, the different bundles of services or products that you're generating. So this is a great way to, to do some teamwork and spark innovation and really get those uh, ideas flowing. So this is another way of looking at the business model canvas. Um, uh, it, it might, you may see, kind of looks like this other one that the one I was previously showing. This just kind of shows uh, in a more graphic way what goes in. So you see a line in the middle uh, that divides on the right side what you would call the market side of the BMC of the business model canvas, uh, which is determined by the market. And on the left side, you will see what is internal, what is mostly determined by management within the company or, or things that you determine yourself, not uh, completely tied to the market. So we see some, some of the blocks, the customer relationships, the customer segments, the revenue streams, and they all have this little uh, drawing that kind of exemplifies what we're talking about. So I want to show you a video. Uh, sometimes it, it's not really uh, a good idea to show videos on a webinar because of the lag and uh, you don't really get to hear that much. So, but I still want to do it because it's a great video and it's going to really help you guys out to understand what we're talking about. So what I'm going, going to do is um, I'm going to put the, the subtitles in there and uh, English subtitles so that we can um, work it out. Let me just check out that if, yeah, it's in French, we're going to put it in English. Cool. So this video describes uh, very briefly how the business model canvas works and very briefly going, goes into each segment. It's only about two minutes long. So um, pay attention, uh, just start making questions, you know, think about your business and how it would apply to your business. So when, when, we're, when we're in the Q&A session, you can ask, hey, so I have this type of product, how would I do this? Okay, so uh, let me just switch on the audio. And I hope you guys can hear it. If not, at least I hope you can read the subtitles. Okay, we're gonna try again. Okay, let's see if this time if this time it works. Let's see. Okay, I'm getting some the audio is not coming through. I'm going to try and uh, 
pump up the speakers, but if you're not able to uh, it's a really good video. So hopefully you're going to be able to hear. Just a moment. Okay, here we go. You guys were able to hear a little bit about it. I know that the audio probably wasn't that good, uh, but if you're able to hear me now, I would uh, like to go on with the presentation. Uh, so if you're not hearing me, just go ahead and uh, and um, send me a, a message through the questions tab. So that was uh, the video that kind of explains a little bit about the different segments of the business model canvas. As you can see, it's a really uh, integral way to approach uh, not only your new business idea, but also if you're planning on launching a service or planning on launching a product. Uh, once you do this business model canvas, you will have a better idea of what it takes to actually do it. And what is most, more, more important, you'll be able to determine the points where uh, you might need some more work or uh, generate more innovation on the pro on the different processes. So let me go ahead and jump into the details. Um, we're going to talk about the different questions you need to ask yourself once you're determining what is going to go on each segment. So these are some guide questions that I've prepared for you uh, that you need to ask yourself in order um, to kind of figure out what your customer segments are or what your revenue channels are. So it's going to be a really fun way to, to, to approach how to create your business model canvas. 
and afterwards, after we go into the details, we're going to do uh, an example that is going to really put things into perspective. So let's go ahead and begin. So we start out with the value propositions block, um, and these are the main things that we need to ask ourselves once we are uh, once we are uh, trying to create uh, the value proposition. So the value proposition block, uh, it's a building block that describes the bundle of products and services that create value for a specific customer segment. Uh, the value proposition is the reason why customers turn to one company or another. It will, it, it's what makes the difference. Uh, it solves a customer problem or satisf satisfies a customer's need. Uh, each value proposition consists of a selected bundle of products or services that cater to the requirements of, of the specific, specific excuse me, customer segment. In this sense, the value proposition is an aggregation or, or bundle of benefits that a company offers with the added features and attributes, but with added features and attributes. Um, the last but not least, uh, the value proposition, the values may be quantitative, and that we're talking about price, we're talking about the speed of service, or you, they may also be qualitative, and in that sense, we're talking about design, uh, customer experience. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about some examples of the elements, uh, the value proposition. So let's go ahead and, and check out the questions. Um, the first question is, what value do we deliver to the customer? Uh, the other question is, which one of our customer's problems are we helping to solve? Uh, also, what bundles of products and services are we offering to each customer segment? Um, and then on this particular question, let's think of uh, an example. Let's say Spotify, this uh, music service. So uh, we're maybe offering bundles uh, or products to a customer segment that is the free user. Uh, and maybe we're offering a more special bundle or product to the customer segment that is a paying customer. So that will be a different type of customers that we may have and different types of, of bundles or services that we want to offer them. Of course, what we're trying to do is, is create uh, revenue or make this a financial viability. So in that sense, um, in that sense, um, sorry, I was reading the question of John Manuel. Uh, yes, he, he's asking if we can have access to the PowerPoint presentation. And, and of course, I will share this with you. Uh, you will be able to access this presentation through the Bootcamp platform website, which I'm going to share with you towards the end of the of the of the presentation. So going back to the question, um, of course, we're trying to 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 show that this is a business model that generates revenue that it makes sense to invest in. So we're uh, trying to get customers uh, to stay with us, to stay with the brand, and also to maybe turn non-paying customers uh, for services such as the free version of Spotify to paying customers such as the premium version of Spotify. Uh, and last, uh, which customers' needs are we satisfying? So once you uh, identify these things, you can have a good idea of what your value propositions are. And uh, here are some characteristics uh, of uh, the value propositions. This is not an, a complete list. It may be uh, your value proposition may have this characteristics, not all of them, maybe some of them, and maybe include even other characteristics. This is just a list of, of the things that we kind of figured out that the value proposition needs to have. So we're talking about uh, newness, um, we're talking about performance, we're talking about customization, uh, getting the job done in terms of, uh, of uh, somebody, somebody wanting to achieve it. Um, a task and uh, your value proposition is giving them a tool to achieve such task. Um, it may be, it may have a characteristics of design, brand status, of course, price. Uh, you you may be uh, doing uh, offering a product that is below the price of um, of the competitors. In that sense, that's the value proposition you're doing. Uh, you may be offering the same type of product, same quality. Uh, same everything but a lower price. So that's the value proposition. And I think this is a good uh, a good moment to kind of talk to you talk to you about being innovative. It's not always generating a new product. So we're going to see in the example that that I made for you guys, which I chose because I think it's a great way to show that you may have the same product, 
but have a disruptive business model and that is you know just as important as innovating with a new product so we may have we may be selling the exact same thing as our uh, competitor but if we're doing something new if we're doing a lower price uh, if we're reducing risk if we're making it accessible then we're creating value uh, for the customers and they may want they will choose us because of that even though we're not specifically innovating on a product per se so as I said cost reduction risk redu reduction accessibility or the convenience or usability of your product or service are important characteristics to have uh, for the value propositions you're doing for your uh, customer. Okay, so just uh, let, let's say, let's give an example of the value proposition uh, in terms of accessibility. Uh, I helped, uh, I was involved in a project that's called Comparlante. Uh, this is a, a virtual platform where blind people or, or people with limited eyesight can access audiobooks uh, at a really fast uh, way because the way that they use the internet is they have the software where the, the, the software reads out every single button and text on the screen of a web page. So when web pages are not engineered to work with the software, it's really a, a hard process for the blind person to actually access an audiobook. So an audiobook, you know, something access to literature is, is something that we as humans need and it's a human right. And uh, the way that we generated value proposition is through accessibility. We created a website that is really easy for blind people to access audiobooks with just three clicks. So that's a way that we're creating value for our customers. And of course, they have different other options, such as Audible, which is an Amazon company. And of course, we're, we, we were never going to be able to compete against Amazon, which they have unlimited resources, literally. Um, but we created a, a different value through accessibility. And that way, our customer segment where would prefer to use our service rather than the Amazon service. So let's go ahead, uh, now that we were talking about customer segments, uh, to customer segments. So we need to ask ourselves, for whom are we creating value? Um, who are our most important customers? Are we catering to the mass market? Is this just a niche market? And, you know, in the in the Comparlante case, um, the, the blind people's uh, audiobooks reading software, uh, it's a niche market. It's people with, with uh, low eyesight levels or people that are blind. And that is not a mass market because Audible, the Amazon company, that caters to a mass market, people that want to hear books instead of reading them. Uh, is this a segmented uh, customer's scenario? Or is this a diversified type of scenario. So these are important questions we need to ask ourselves when we determine what or whom our customer services, our customer segments are. Remember that this is the, the people um, uh, that we're creating value to, that we're giving them the value proposition. And the way that this connects uh, the customer segments with the value proposition is through the revenue streams. You know, Customers are the ones that are willing to pay for the value proposition we're offering. So here we need to ask ourselves, what, uh, for what value are our customers really willing to pay? Are they willing to pay more? Are they looking to pay less? Uh, for what do they currently pay? What is the, you know, if there's a similar product, what are they paying now? And what can we offer them to shift to our company instead of, uh, of the other one of the competition? Uh, how are they currently paying is a really important question you need to ask yourself because it might be uh, an only cash segment market where the, 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 the way that they pay for this types of products or services is cash. In that sense, you're going to need to have physical spaces where people can go and pay. Or are they paying through, let's say, uh, virtual platforms? Uh, let's say PayPal. Let's talk about... Uh, different ways that you can actually pay for stuff and not really using physical bills to do it. Uh, and also, how would they uh, how would they prefer to pay? So let's say that people are now accessing a product and the only way they're able to buy it is through physical cash. Um, maybe they prefer paying virtually, directly from their bank accounts to have access to this product. So let's ask ourselves, what would they prefer? Because that's a really good way to add value to the customer. 
And finally, how much does each revenue stream con contribute to the overall revenues? Uh, of course, you may have uh, different revenue streams in one same business model, uh, and, but you need to know which one is more important than the other. Going really quickly through, through the types, uh, this is something that, that you can uh, revisit w once you have this presentation and kind of do your own research about it. But we have a lot of different types of revenue streams. Uh, just to name a few, there's a, you know, it might be something related to advertising, uh, licensing, asset sale, usage fee, uh, many different thing, things. And of course you have different pricings as well. You have dynamic pricing, you have fixed pricing, that it really depends a lot on the type of service or product you're providing and it depends a lot on your business model. So remember, uh, whichever type and whichever type of fixed pricing uh, you choose, uh, it needs to make sense and it needs to show potential investors or potential uh, team members that it's going to make sense for the product. So let's go on to the next block. Uh, this is the customer relationships. Uh, this is just above uh, on the business model canvas. It's, it's located above the um, above this one, above the revenue streams, uh, and, what we're, and above also the channels. Um, what we're talking about in customer relationships, it's what type of relationship does each of our customer segments expect us to establish and maintain with them? Uh, which ones have we established already, and how are they integrated with the rest of our business model, and how costly are they? So this is a, a basically a way that you keep your customers, how you, you interact with them and how you uh, make them feel happy about consuming your product or your service. So some examples of customer relationships uh, are personal assistants, our dedicated personal assistants, you know, a more, a more private type of, of uh, interaction, self-service, which is completely um, not personal, it's quite the opposite. Uh, where we don't have a, a person on the on the on our company side, just the the customer himself, himself, which the information that we may put out put out there, uh, automated services, which is also an impersonal way to 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 interact with customers, but it's also a really cost efficient way to interact with them. Uh, there's also communities uh, and co-creation. So these are just some examples of customer relationships. And here's the, there's no good or bad customer relationship, it's just what is efficient for your business model. Let's say that, that your business model needs a person that is always there 24-7 through a call center or through an office and can, can provide that customer uh, relation to, to, to your customer. Uh, or maybe you want something that is more cost effective and you generate an automated services type of uh, model where it's really more cost effective than having a personal uh, a person there for your customers. So it depends on your business model. There's no right, there's no wrong. It should, it's just what makes sense. Uh, let's talk about, let's move along and talk about the channels. Um, here are the, the different questions that I propose. Uh, you need to know through which channels do our customer segments want to be reached. Uh, also, how are we reaching them now? What is the current status and where do we want to go? Uh, how are how are our channels integrated? Are there working? Are there our channels working together? Are they generating inefficiencies? Uh, which ones work best? Uh, which ones are most cost efficient? This is an important word you need to remember: cost efficient. And how how are we integrating them with customer routines? So how efficient are them? Are they in uh, actually communicating and taking value from the customer to our company? And when I say value, I mean financial value. So different phases uh, for, for the channels. Here I mapped out a little bit about the different phases. Uh, we're talking about awareness. How do we raise awareness about our company's products and services? Uh, there's also evaluation, the next phase, and how do, we, how do we help customers evaluate our organization's value proposition? Uh, there's also purchase, which is how do we allow customers to purchase specific products and services. Uh, the, for number four, it's delivery. How do we deliver a value proposition to the customers? Is this an online, if it's an online company, then we deliver it virtually, or is it, do we need a physical delivery system where, let's say, Amazon 
uh, but that's a bad example because of their competitors. But let's talk about, uh, let's say, um, eBay, where they need a physical uh, truck to d actually deliver the product to the, the customer's home. Finally, uh, the last phase is the, the after sales. We're talking about how do we provide post-purchase customer support, and this is kind of connected with the customer relationships as well. So this is a this is a, a two-way street. Um, it's always interconnected, and it's really important that you are able to differentiate between each phase of the channels that you're generating and that you're transporting the the value that the customer provides, which is uh, their money or or their feedback, to the value proposition and back. Uh, also, so, uh, the other block is key activities. I uh, want to go a little bit faster because I really want to go ahead and get to the to the practical example I prepared for you guys. So the key activities, uh, we're talking about what key activities do our value propositions require, what activities we need to do in order to make the value proposition a reality. Uh, we're talking about also key activities in terms of distribution channels, of customer relationships, of revenue streams, uh, you know, the stuff we need to do in order to get things done. Uh, different categories, we're talking about production, problem solving, or platform network. Uh, this is basically the activities we need to carry out uh, in order to, to make everything, you know, make the business a reality. The key resources is tied, very tied to that. Uh, we're talking about uh, the, what, key what key resources do our value propositions require our distribution channels, customer relationships as well, and revenue streams as well. Uh, this is uh, what we need to make it a reality. So the types of resources, they may be physical, let's say a factory, trucks, um, the, the materials, the basic materials we need to create a product. Uh, we're talking about intellectual resources such as brand patents, copyrights, data, of course human resources, the people that manage the company and that work in the company and financial resources as well. Of course, we always need some financial resources. Uh, the key partners, uh, as I said before, this is uh, entrepreneurship is a, is a collective thing, it's a community thing. We cannot isolate ourselves and, and become good entrepreneurs or thrive in the business. So this is the section where, where we identify who our key partners are, who are our key suppliers, which key resources are we acquiring from partners, um, as I said before, maybe we want to uh, acquire uh, or uh, or buy the service of marketing for a company and not have a marketing department within the company. It might not be uh, cost efficient, but me, we may want to pay an outside company to uh, create a, a marketing strategy for a product, for example. And which key activities do partners perform? In this case, it would be marketing. Uh, so motivation, motivations for partnerships, we're talking about optimization and economy, reduction of risks and uncertainty, and acquisition of particular resources and activities. So it's always a good idea to evaluate if you need a whole department to create a marketing strategy or just pay a fee for someone else to do it. And this is kind of goes in hand in hand with economies of scale. And what I mean by that is that the marketing company will be way more efficient at creating a marketing strategy for us than we can if we're not specialized in doing marketing strategies. So those are the key partners that we need. Finally, the last block, uh, the cost structure. This is something that, that you usually leave for last because once you have the infrastructure of your business, uh, you're able to determine what the cost structure will be and what things are you going to be uh, spending your money yet. So the key questions here are what are the most important costs inherent in our business model, which key resources are most expensive, and which key activities are most expensive. It's always important to know what is taking the largest percentage of your budget. So um, here's a distinction you need to make by yourself. Is a, is a, a good question. Is your business uh, more cost driven or is it more value driven? So if we're if we if it's more cost driven, we're talking about the leanest cost structure. We're talking about low price value proposition, maximum autom automation, extensive outsourcing. And if we're talking about value driven, a business that is more value driven, it's more focused on value creation and premium val value proposition. 
So those are, those are the, the nine blocks. Uh, we have one more slide here, uh, just to sample characteristics of uh, the costs we're going to have. This may be fixed costs, such as salaries, rent, utilities, something that it's always going to stay the same each month. We have variable cost, which uh, may vary each month in, uh, in magnitude. Uh, economies of scale, I was talking to you a little bit earlier. If you uh, produce something at a mass level, you're going to be more efficient at producing. Uh, and it's kind of the same concept uh, with the economies of scope. So, uh, I wanted to talk to you, I want to show you uh, an example. Uh, this is an example I created um, that you guys are going to be able to, to wrap your heads around the business model canvas. So, what I did here is the BMC, a business model canvas for Cheapo Airlines. Uh, this is a, a made up company. Uh, it's basically an airline with a discount price. I'm pretty sure you guys know about these types of airlines. Uh, they, uh, they offer really cheap tickets to travel um, all over the place. Uh, and they are really large airlines such as American Airlines or Avianca or whatever company are usually not able to compete with them because of their, uh, their disruptive business model. And this is a very good example of what I was saying before when, when I was talking about you don't need a new product or a new service or an innovative revolutionizing, revolutionizing product uh, in order to, to be successful. You may be offering the same type of product, in this case airline, uh, being an airline, uh, but you may have a disruptive business model that makes the whole difference and that makes you really competitive and makes you grow really fast. So that's the case here uh, with Cheapo Airlines. Uh, we're talking about discount airlines that have a, a business model that is really cost effective and they're able to offer really cheap flights for a specific customer segment, which is budget travelers, you know, people that are not looking for a first class seat and having uh, a seat that becomes a bed and have every five seconds someone ask you if you want a soda or if you want to eat. Um, so this is a really type of different customer segment that they're able to offer these tickets to. Um, and it's a customer segment that before wasn't really listened to. So it's a really interesting example. Uh, we're going to go ahead and start doing the business model canvas for this particular uh, organization or company that I named Cheapo Airlines. So. Uh, kind of, I was getting ahead of myself, uh, what makes a discount airline successful? And that is just one thing in this case, and that is their disruptive business model. And that is what we're going to go through tonight, or today, this afternoon, um, with the business model canvas for Cheapo Airlines. So let's go ahead and start. Here's the business model canvas. We have our nine segments, and we're going to start by the value propositions what does this discount airline uh, generate in value propositions? So it's basically two things. The first thing is cheap flights. That is uh, the value of, of the thing they're generating that creates value for their customers. And of course, it's uh, no frills. What, what I mean with no frills is that they are, um, they have a system where they don't have uh, ne unnecessary extras or embellishment, this is what I was talking about, about people offering you uh, lunch or dinner or sodas or extra baggage space. This is something that rises the cost, uh, the cost of uh, buying uh, a ticket. And there's a particular segment of customers that are not interested in more space, that are not interested in having dinner uh, on the flight or and are not interested in having free drinks on the flight. And that customer segment is the budget travelers I was talking to you about. So for Cheapo Airlines, their value proposition is cheap flights and they're offering no frills, no unnecessary extras or embellishment. And that really helps them out in driving down their costs. So they can offer for their customer segments, their budget travelers, they can offer cheap tickets. So let's talk about the revenue streams. Uh, and there are basically two. It's tickets, the ones that they're selling to these budget travelers, and the other revenue streams that it's also uh, uh, generating from the no-frills proposition, it's the fees. So if the budget travelers want to actually have a drink during the flight, 
or they want to have a, a bite to eat, or if they want to have, if they want to carry an extra suitcase, they need to pay a fee, and that turns into an additional revenue stream for uh, for cheapo airlines. So we can see that the budget travelers are connected through the value proposition through the revenue streams, and that are basically two streams for this company: it's the tickets that they sell, and the fees that arise from budget travelers wanting to consume. Uh, the frills, the, the 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 unnecessary extras or the embellishment. So now we have completed uh, three segments of our business canvas. Uh, we have completed the value proposition. We have identified the customer segment that we're given the value proposition to, uh, and of course we have identified the revenue streams of uh, of our uh, company of Cheapo Airlines. Uh, let's go ahead and identify the channels. This is a very important to drive the costs also down for for this uh, discount airlines and it's that they don't have a physical office most of the time their channels the way that they uh, connect customers and deliver the value proposition in this in this uh, example the, the cheap flights the tickets uh, it's through call centers and through the internet so this is they have the website they don't need to be um, paying salaries of, of people that are actually on, an, on a physical office, they don't need to pay, be paying rent. Uh, they do everything through call centers where people just you know, pick up the phone and, 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 uh, and buy a cheap ticket or uh, they go on the internet, which is more common, and just buy the different tickets that they want. So those are the two channels for, for cheapo airlines. Uh, they work with call centers and they work through the internet. And this also helps them drive the costs down since they don't have a physical space that they need to pay rent for or, or pay staff to be there. Um, in this sense, the customer relationships, uh, remember I was talking to you about there is no right or wrong in this segment. For, uh, for cheapo airlines, it, uh, it helps them to have an automated and personal customer relationships. And that also goes hand in hand with what I was talking to you about, about being cost effective and not having a fiscal office, for example. If they have an automated and impersonal uh, customer relations, they, they have everything automated. They don't need to um, have people, uh, people physically uh, picking up phones and uh, doing this uh, customer relationship uh, scenario. So it's, uh, for them it works. For this hypothetic company it works. Uh, in general, for the discount, airlines industry it works perfectly um, and that is one of the reasons well all of these are one of the reasons why they are able to provide that cheap flight that ch really cheap ticket airline flight and uh, big airlines uh, are not able to compete with them so <clears throat> in the spirit of continuing how they drive their costs down and how they are financially viable let's go to the re uh, to the key resources so two things for this uh, for this particular example. One thing it's uh, they only use a single aircraft model, and this this is our key resources a key resource because it helps them uh, um, be efficient when training uh, the staff when training pilots. They only have one single air, aircraft model. They don't don't need to be training different types of pilots for different types of aircrafts by normalizing the type of aircraft they use, they uh, uh, really are efficient at allocating resources to training. Also, they only land on cheap airports. These are airports that uh, are not the main ones. Uh, we live here in Washington, D.C., so we're not talking about Reagan, which is the, the, the airport that's near the city. Uh, we're talking about cheap airports that are a little, a little bit more far away but are really cheap to land on because uh, once you land on an airport you need to pay a certain fee. So this, uh, by working with cheap airports on the, on the outsides of the, of the big cities, you're able to lower the cost of landing on that airport and also uh, there are even airports that pay you to land on their airports. So it's a really good way for them to, to, to generate uh, income there and to, and to lower their costs of operating. And the key activities, one of the key activities that Cheapo Airline does, it's quick turnarounds. This means that they, uh, once they land, they do the most efficient uh, way possible to be on the air again. You know, make the most 
amount of trips per day. So that means just landing, you know, getting people off the plane and then just starting off again into a different trip. So quick turnarounds will be a key activity that, um, that helps uh, keep the value proposition in place. Re let's remember that the main value proposition is the cheap flights. So you see these arrows that I put, put in here, <coughs> excuse me, uh, where we're talking about the single aircraft model and cheap airports and the quick turners around that is connected to the value proposition because it allows them to actually offer this cheap flights. Um, then we have uh, one of the, of the last uh, building blocks. It's the key partners. Uh, this is another important thing that cheaper airlines needs to have, and that is key partnerships with car rentals, uh, with hotels, with insurance for the traveler's insurance. These are uh, things that they don't they don't have specific departments within their company, uh, so they outsource these types of relationships so that they can connect their customers with, let's say, a car rental, or uh, if they can book a bundle of a, of a cheap flight of cheapo airlines with a, with a hotel for, for their destination. So these, these are some of the partners for this specific uh, example I'm working with you guys. And finally, um, the cost structure, uh, it's all driven down to its most efficient way. Uh, we're talking the things they need to spend money on is maintenance of the aircrafts, uh, the training, which I said before, it's uh, it's uh, lowered the cost of training by using a single aircraft model and not different types of planes. Uh, we're talking about airports where they land only on cheap airports, uh, and even they get paid to land on those cheap airports or not pay too many uh, fees. And the call centers as well; they need they, they outsource the call centers um, so that they have this channel of selling tickets uh, to the budget travelers and they don't really need to uh, spend too much money on it because they can outsource the call centers and, and just provide that service through a company that specializes on call centers. So this is what the business model looks like uh, in the end for this cheapo airlines. We have the nine segments. You can see that all of them are connected somehow and it makes sense financially, it makes sense uh, for the infrastructure, it makes sense in every way and it's a really uh, great example on how uh, same product, you know, airlines are by creating a disruptive business model um, are really able to compete with huge airlines such as American Airlines and, and, and really get a part of that market. So this is what I wanted, I wanted you guys to show that it's really possible, it's really simple to do it. Uh, you just need to, to sit down with your team and start working on this. As I said before, a great way to do it is to uh, uh, use a big cardboard and uh, with markers do the, the different squares and then just go ahead and start pasting post-it notes in there and do this type of brainstorming. And you know, as I said before, it may be done for, uh, for a product, it may be done for a service, or it may be done for the company itself. It's never too late or too early to start using the business model canvas. So. Let's go ahead, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you can go ahead and start typing them down. I'll give you guys a, a minute, just a couple, uh, to start typing down those questions and I will be more than glad to answer them for you. So go ahead, guys. And remember, if you're able to, uh, to if you have a working microphone, you can go ahead and uh, push the raised hand button. Uh, once you push it, we'll know that you want to make your intervention through the microphone and we'll unmute your microphone. Thank you again, Mr. Gautier. Uh, we have a question here. It's about if the um, two business of the same group could complement themselves. To the, the two businesses of the same group? Was that the question? Yeah, uh, two business of the same group, but that are complementary. 
Uh, sure, sure. So, so uh, two businesses of the same group. Right. So, so I guess uh, what you're referring to, if um, if two different companies can work on a on the same business model canvas, is that it? Yeah. That's it. Uh, sure. I guess if if you're not competitors, uh, you can go ahead and, and work on a on a strategy. That remember that. Uh, an important part of, uh, of the business model canvas and of uh, entrepreneurship itself is to have partnerships and alliances. So I think uh, it's a great idea. It's a, it's a good idea. I've never thought of it that way. So getting together with a, with a partner and uh, creating a, a business model canvas, uh, cooperating with each other, it's a great idea. And yes, I, I, it, would be, it could be done. Okay. Thank you. Uh, you mentioned an example about an airline, mm -hmm. uh, but I would like uh, to ask you something. It's about, if, do you know any successful case that had used this business model at the start? Or could you mention the type of business that usually takes this as its model? Right. So um, as, I, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the, in the presentation, this has been used for for many years, and it's applicable for every single company out there. Uh, if you have any type of service, you're going to be able to create a business model canvas. So it's not only for a specific sector, it's not only for a specific industry, but rather it's uh, it's open to everyone to do it. You can do it with an idea. You can do it with a with a service or a product. Just uh, on the Spanish version of this webinar, uh, we were talking about uh, how WhatsApp, the mobile app, messaging app, um, did this business model canvas and we had the different customer segments they have, the different revenue se uh, segments they have, and it's always going to be different, you know, a different uh, customer segment, a different revenue uh, segment, but it can be applicable to any type of business. Okay. Thank you so much, Mr. Cloutier. Uh, I think there are not more questions. So, would you like to add something more before finish this session? Uh, well, yeah, I would just uh, thank you guys for for your time being here. Uh, I know some of you guys are celebrating Thanksgiving, so thanks a lot for making the time uh, for being here. Um, just to remind you guys that this is a part. This webinars are part of the. Of uh, the T TIC Americas competition, the Talent and Innovation Competition of the Americas, and um, also that this session was recorded, and we're going to be uploading it alongside my presentation, and you're going to be able to access that through the bootcamp platform. That, if you allow me to show you very briefly, uh, you can access it going through the www.ybt.net slash bootcamp. And once you access uh, the YBT bootcamp, you're going to be able to check out the previous recordings. Uh, you're going to be able to check out the upcoming activities. And also, uh, you're going to be able to see this recording and also download the presentation I was giving today. So check out the YBT Net bootcamp. And go also to the, comp the website of the competition, which is TICAmericas.net, where you're going to be able to register your business ideas, have access to uh, more trainings, and of course, have the opportunity of um, earning some seed capital and participating in the finals. So thanks a lot, guys. Um, I'm going to leave here my uh, contact information. If there's any additional questions you guys might have, um, you know, shoot me an email. I'll be more than glad to to reply. So that will be. That would be it for me. Uh, have a great uh, Thursday. Uh, have a great Thanksgiving and enjoy your weekend, guys. Thank you so much.